right, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. You know, in my travels during the week, I've gone to some modern contemporary churches, and they all want to compete with Starbucks down the street or Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf Company down the street, and uh, went to a big Calvary Chapel the other day, and I'm not kidding you, they have a, a coffee cafe, bar, whatever you want to call it, which is bigger than any Starbucks I've ever been to. And uh, a lot of big screen TVs up on the wall outside, so you can sit out there, drink your drink, and watch the service taking place indoors at, inside the auditorium without ever having to go in. And it's set up for them on purpose that way. Some funny the things that, but but I was thinking, we got to uh, Hebrew, the book of Hebrews today. I saw one church that had a coffee cart. Uh, you've heard that joke uh, that that uh, men are supposed to make the coffee, right? Because it yeah. says Hebrews yeah. in the in the Bible. Uh, um, I went to one and oh, at the Calvary Chapel. In fact, their store is called Holy Grounds. Cafe. Oh my God. <laughs> Holy Grounds Cafe. Um, what was another one? I saw, oh, went to a church and they had a, a coffee bar thing. It was called Jehovah, J Jehovah Java. Yeah. Yeah. Jehovah Java. The guy I was working with, it was a, was a JW. He was so offended by that. <laughs> Inside, I thought it was funny. You know, Jehovah Java. Um, Holy Grounds Cafe. There's no reason to compete with the secular world down the street um, with some lame name you think was clever and cute. But uh, uh, oh, there was another there was another coffee uh, set up at a church called the Great Awakening. <laughs> the Great Awakening. So it's during service. So I guess you either get your um, cafe americano, uh, your your. Um, What's that? What do they call that? What's that? What's that real strong stuff? Strong coffee? Espresso. Espresso. Espresso, right. Espresso, a little bit of water in it, kind of dilute that. Um, or just make it extra strong, extra strong French roast. Uh, but the Great Awakening is what some of them call it. Well, here we are, the Great Awakening, I mean Hebrews chapter 12. And we got down through verse 17 last time. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, speaking of Esau, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it earnestly with tears. Let's continue reading verses 18 through 24 today. For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mount, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake, verse 22, but ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in the... <coughs> excuse me, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of, of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Notice the, the tribulation tone of this section of verses, this passage. Nothing is said about anyone being saved by grace through faith, plus nothing. There's nothing hinted at in this passage about anyone being justified by faith. There is nothing here mentioned about not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Instead, we find words such as these, for they could not endure, verse 20. 
So terrible was the sight, etc. Verse 21. Uh, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Verse 24. And then later, verse 25. See that ye refuse not him. Uh, him that speaketh from heaven. Verse 25. Whose voice then shook the earth. Verse 26. Serve God acceptably. Verse 28. Uh, and then our God is a consuming fire. Verse 29. You don't read much of that language in Paul's epistles to the uh, different churches, how that they had, God had saved them apart from any effort or any work on their part. And I want you to notice particular, particularly the Jewish designation for God. Verse 29, our God. I want you to run back, if you will, to Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 15. But with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, verse 3. Because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That was Simon Peter on the day of Pentecost. There weren't any Jews present when he said those words. Go back, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. And this is an obvious one. Starting there, verse, uh, well, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There were no Gentiles being told to pray the Lord's Prayer, right? Uh, by the way, this is just a side lesson. I wasn't intending to dwell on this. But notice this section here, Matthew chapter 6. He says in verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. He says in verse 6, or rather, rather in verse 7, But when ye pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father, Jews, knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, so forth. When the Lord Jesus wanted to teach his disciples to pray, to call upon their father, he said, when you pray, don't just say the same thing over and over and over. That's what the heathen do. Because they don't know God, they don't know how to talk to God. So they just mumble, repeat the same words again and again. But when you pray, pray something like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc. He said, when you pray, don't just say the same thing over and over again, but pray something like this. That's why he says, after this manner, therefore. He didn't tell them, repeat after me. Ready, begin. So, he says, when you pray, pray something like this. And he gives them an example of a prayer. So right in the context, the Lord Jesus said, here's how a prayer should be constructed. These are the elements, these are the things that one of your prayers ought to include. But when you pray, don't just repeat the same thing every time. And what's the one prayer <coughs> Roman Catholics repeat every time? Yeah. Right in the context, Jesus told them, don't. Don't just repeat it, and yet that's the one they insist on repeating. Right in the kind, how could you miss it? You know what the word obvious means? The 
word obvious literally means something standing in the way. You'll trip over it if you're not careful. I mean, this is obvious, right? <laughs> but some people keep tripping over it. Yeah. It's right there. I mean, it couldn't be plainer. Don't just repeat the same thing, but pray something like this. And yet the one prayer they insist on repeating is this one. The one Christ told them not to repeat. Well, all right. But you see, the Jewish designation of God was our Father, or our God. And, um, and so forth. You can find probably a dozen other references like those in the Word of God. Paul only uses this term one time, 1 Thessalonians 3, 9. For what thanks can we render to God, again, for, your, for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? When he wrote that to the Thessalonians, he certainly knew he was a Jew and that most of them were Gentiles. The Our God of Hebrews chapter 12 is not a reference to the God of the New Testament church age. That's a, Jewish, that's a designation of the God of Israel. The God of Hebrews 12 is mentioned in connection with Moses here in our text, verses 18, 19, 20, 21. And he's mentioned in connection with Mount Sinai. The quotation, was it verse 29 down there, is taken from Deuteronomy 4, verse 24. The Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. You also notice Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, found there in verse 24. Now it's tempting to assume that there are only two covenants or two testaments to be considered or worried about in the Bible. One had to do with Israel and the law of Moses and the commandments at that time, and the other dealing with that deals with the New Testament, saved by grace through faith plus nothing. And that's as far as 90% of modern Christians and modern preachers ever go. They don't go any deeper than that. But don't be sidetracked with the word covenant in this passage. In fact, look back at Hebrews chapter 8. Turn back one or two pages. Hebrews 8. And let's read verses 10 through 12. <clears throat> For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. It's a national promise to the Jew, to the Jews, um, and uh, an application to the second advent, uh, as Jesus Christ comes back as the king of the Jews. Hebrews 12, verses 18 through 24, is aimed at Jews in the tribulation. If you don't get anything else, uh, from that, from this section today, they can get that much. And back in our, back in our passage, Hebrews 12, verse 18, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, so forth. The real Mount Zion, built on the real um, heavenly Jerusalem, <clears throat> is over your head. You can't touch it. You can't feel it. You can't be touched like um, Mount Sinai was. And uh, is that? Amen. Genesis. We're not in the book of Genesis right now, sweet. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But the real um, Mount Zion or Zion is over your head. Satan tried to scale that mount. Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And. Um, ended up being cast down to hell. Verse 20 in our text, For they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. I want you to go back to the book of Exodus, 
chapter 19. Exodus 19. Exodus 19. And let's read verses 12 and 13. This is the passage being alluded to there in Hebrews 12. Exodus 19, verses 12 and 13. Thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up uh, into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. <clears throat> there shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. It shall not live, whether the, excuse me, when the trumpet soundeth, and they come up to the mount. And then down at verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down and charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And the implication is that, or the inference is that, the person would be, would drop dead right away. Either, either they would be found to have gone through that, that temporary restriction, that temporary boundary, uh, where God told them not to go, uh, and, and the judgment of the congregation would, would find someone guilty and then stone them with stones, or God would be casting darts down, he would be casting uh, his judgment, firebrands, however, whatever you want to describe, however you want to describe God sending judgment to kill the person on the spot himself. That part is not spelled out, but either one would be valid. However, the, the border or the boundary of uh, Mount Sinai that God said for them not to go beyond was probably four miles in length, all total. It would be a large area for them to keep an eye on to make sure no one crossed over the, the threshold where God didn't want them going. So it may be that God had to do the one, be the one watching out to make sure no one's beast, no one's uh, animal went there that wasn't supposed to go there, or someone went there saying, I want to see what's going on on Mount Sinai, where Moses had been going to speak to God and so forth. Uh, let me turn the page here and keep going. Look down at verse uh, 21. I may finish a little early today, but we're going to come back and finish this chapter next week from about verse... 18, 19, uh, again, down to the end of the chapter next week. But um, verse 21, Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Well, nowhere in the Old Testament did Moses say that. Those words aren't found anywhere in the law of Moses or in the Old Testament. Paul must have had access or had knowledge of something that God wanted written that didn't have any manuscript evidence for. And uh, you want to point that out. You want to keep that verse in mind because modern Christianity today wants to say that no translation is inspired by God. Only the originals are inspired. And I tried to summarize this in the front of my book on contradictions. First of all, when someone says only the originals are inspired, tell them uh, there are no originals. No one's ever found them. Even if you found them, you wouldn't know if they were the originals or not. They probably don't have a you know first draft stamped on the front in front of them. You know. So you wouldn't even recognize them if you did find them. So there is no such thing as the originals. Well, when someone says, well, the originals were inspired, but you can't say that about a translation. Let me ask you, when the New Testament writers um, wrote in Greek, and they were translating some verse from the Old Testament in Hebrew, and they did this about 200 times in the New Testament, didn't they have to translate? Sure they did. What do you mean translation is not inspired? You probably find at least 200 verses in the New Testament that are translations from the Old Testament, and uh, they're inspired. At least you have to believe that. 
uh, to say that, well, no translation is inspired by God. You know what modern Christians want to believe? They want to believe that 200 to 250 years before the time of Christ, a group of Greeks in Alexandria, Egypt, translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, a group of 70 scholars, 70 translators, seven, actually 72, 72, six from uh, each of the 12 tribes. They got together and they translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, uh, which is a total of 72 scribes, but they keep calling it the 70, the Septuagint, the Septuagint, the translating work of the 70. We've been studying the book of Nehemiah, and uh, Ezra was a Levite. Ezra was a ready scribe to serve the Lord in the hand of the Lord. But we don't read that all the tribes were given the responsibility of translating or safeguarding the scriptures. That was the job of the Levites alone, to safeguard the scriptures. So if six men from each of the 12 tribes were going to translate the Bible together, why would God honor it? Why should God honor it? But they want to maintain that this translation into Greek was the scriptures used and read by the Lord Jesus and his apostles 200 years later. Well, if their definition of no translation is inspired, then the Bible used by Jesus himself was not inspired. Using their definition. So there's a lot more to being a Bible belief, Bible, and also every single modern version of the Bible still cites that quote of Moses, I exceedingly tremble and quake, even though there's no manuscript evidence for it anywhere. There's a lot more to being a Bible believer than saying, well, the manuscripts, uh, the manuscripts. I'll show you a verse in your Bible. Someone's got the NIV. I'll show you a verse in your Bible that there's no manuscript evidence for. You say, well, which one? Well, go to this one. Go to this one right here. Also, we will go back to Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you got to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. He didn't say that anywhere in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. There's no verse uh, written by any of those Gospel writers where Christ had said those words. But here again, the Apostle Paul uh, offers something that there's no manuscript evidence for. And the same arguments apply um, all the modern versions cite it as well. They hope the reader doesn't dig too deep, and they hope the reader doesn't notice it just passes over and assumes, well, it must be in the gospel somewhere. It's not in the gospel anywhere. So there's a lot more to being a Bible believer. To be a Bible believer uh, is not, well, I think we have the very best set of manuscripts available. That's why I believe the Bible. That's no good reason. I believe the Bible because I have the Bible in my hands. And that may sound like circular reasoning, but a Bible believer assumes that the Bible he's holding in his hand, as it's given to him, as he's received it, is perfect. There are no demonstrable mistakes in it. Uh, there may be some things that I don't fully understand, I can't fully explain, and I don't have all the answers to it, but uh, I'll let God be decide how much of that I need to know when I reach the judgment seat of Christ. It's up to God then to vindicate it and to support it. And if, if I'm supposed to know why there was no manuscript uh, citation for Moses' words there, then God's doing a pretty bad job because he hasn't told me what that, what that is. So I'm putting it in God's court, letting God decide how much I need to know and how much I'm going to be accountable for at the judgment seat. But... Um, Someone who's worshiping man and worshiping modern Bibles and worshiping modern scholarship uh, is not much of a Bible student to begin with. Our job is to let the Bible correct us, not the other way around. Right? 
we don't correct the Bible. The Bible's job is to correct us. And uh, with that, I know it's a little early, but I'm going to have to finish today because I want to bite off a bigger chunk as we finish this chapter, uh, God willing, next time. And I didn't want to run too long with it and break it up today. So let's, uh, let's conclude. I appreciate your patience with me. You know, we've got a couple minutes. What you can do is uh, we've talked about some of the verses, some of the texts uh, in modern Bibles that are, that are flawed, that undermine the, the great doctrines of God. For example, Luke, this one I'd like to cite a lot because it's, it's, it's easy to see, it's easy to show. Luke chapter 2, verse 33 says, when, when they brought the baby Jesus to be dedicated in the temple, and Simeon said wonderful things about him. Luke chapter 2, verse 33, the Bible reads, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken about him. All of the new versions say, His father and mother marveled at those things. Or some of them, like the New Living Translation, they say, His parents. But... How many of you know that Joseph was not Christ's father? You see your hand. <laughs> Every dumb Roman Catholic knows that. He's got a whole religion based on Mary's perpetual virginity, right? Dr. Ruckman asked a great question. If you're going to believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, don't you also have to believe in the perpetual virginity of Joseph? <laughs> <laughs> they never teach that. They never teach the other side of the coin. Well, of course you would, unless he was a Kennedy and he just went off and, you know, fool around like, like they did. But uh, <laughs> some of you are shaking your heads. You don't want to laugh out loud because it might show up on the video. Well, it's okay. Let it go. Laugh if you want to. But so take uh, Luke verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 33, and show that to somebody and say, by that subtle change, by changing Joseph uh, to his father, they say that Joseph was Christ's father. They undermine the virgin birth. They call into question the virgin birth, and they undermine the deity of Jesus himself Amen. by that subtle change. You say, well, that's not much of a change. Yeah, but you see how much can be changed by simply uh, altering a word? That's why a Bible believer believes every single word in the book he's holding is there by the providence and the direction and the will of God. Accept it as it is. I don't even change the punctuation. No. Because that might be there for a purpose, and God wants me to see it that way. Right. And so the words we read, the vocabulary God's given to us. <clears throat> I started listening to Charles Elster's Verbal Advantage program about a year and a half ago. Close to two years now. And I remember the radio commercials, Russian and Bus program about 10, 12 years ago. I, I always thought, yeah, that sounds interesting. I'd like to listen to that. But <clears throat> whether it's right or wrong, people do judge you by the words you use. When you speak, and you speak well, you command respect. You move ahead faster. And the benefit of verbal advantage is all you have to do is listen. This, that was the text of the radio commercial. I'm not, that's not off the top of my head. That was just from the radio commercial. So I started listening to it, and I was amazed at how many wonderful and uh, educated, intelligent words of educated speakers this creator of this program threw in that comes straight from the King James Bible. How many of you ever use the word edify in your daily conversation? Probably not many. Lascivious? And so forth. But this guy included a lot of these. I, I, I emailed him. I said, I see how many great words from the Bible you've included in your program. He emailed me back. And uh, you know, the English language has over a million words in it. And the King James Bible, of course, that list is growing all the time. But the King James Bible only used about 8,000 words. To express everything in it. It represents the, the acme, the apex 
of the English language, the pinnacle of its development. It represents the highest form the English language ever, language ever took within the one cover, from front to back. Amen. And uh, so that's why I don't think it's our job to change anything in our Bible. No. It's, the job, it's the job of the Holy Spirit to change me as I read it Amen. and to educate me. I'm not very bright or intelligent. But the more I expose myself to the Word of God itself, the more I feel like God, God can finally get through my hard head, my ignorance, and teach me some things about His book. And it's a blessing every time. All right, let's stop right there. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. So my, I went to an independent Baptist, King James only church before I came here. I might have shared with you that was. And I was talking with one of the associate pastors about King James only. Yeah, we're King James only, but we don't believe that the King James Bible is inspired. Well, that's what it says. What? Interesting, isn't it? There's a difference between someone who is a, um, a Bible believer and someone who simply uses the Bible because other people are familiar with it, they've heard it before, and that's what they expect to hear. So we're using that Bible. We don't really believe it from cover to cover that it has no mistakes, and our job is to learn it and not to, not to change it. There's a big difference between them. Right. And I didn't finish the thought. I, was, I, started, I got myself sidetracked. But go to Luke 2.33 or go to other verses like that. Go to, the, go to uh, John 1.18. No man had seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Uh, John 1.18 in the JW Bible says, No man had seen God at any time. The only begotten God mm. has made him known. They, they, they want to make Jesus a lesser God than God the Father. And by, they also contradict themselves because that, that suggests there's more than one God. A great God and a small God. New American Standard Version. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten God. They read that their Bible reads exactly as the JW Bible reads. So you want to find those verses that are clearly flawed. They undermine the, the great doctrine of Christianity and the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, then you go and show your unsaved your 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 friend with a new version that you know those same mistakes are also in the JW's Bible. And, and they let him see that there's an equivalent between equivalence between the JW's Bible and the, the book he says is the Bible. And show the, the great uh, superiority of the King James text. It's like, you know, Daniel, was it Daniel 3, 25 or something? Lo, I see four men loosed and walking about, and behold, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. All of our modern Bibles say, a son of the gods, small g. Mm. And um, so there's no, there's no allowance for Jesus Christ to have appeared, made some Old Testament um, appearance, preview, coming attractions, if you will, um, and, and elevate the deity of Jesus Christ because they've changed the language in so many places. You say, well, that's exactly as the JW Bible reads. You want to, you want to compare their modern corrupt version to the Jehovah Witness Bible. In as many places as you can and show the similarities because most professing Christians today will at least say I don't I don't agree with the JWs and I certainly wouldn't recommend their Bible but then why are your why is your Bible match their Bible in so many places that's good answer a fool according to his folly lest he be wise in his own conceit the book of Proverbs said 